Hello, and welcome to another episode of Such a Nightmare, Conversations About Horror. My name is Dr. Katherine Troyer, and joining me again is Anthony Tresca. Hello! This is a podcast devoted to thoughtful discussions about that fine line between the horrific and the horrible. Each episode looks at a specific horror text that is, for better or worse, giving us nightmares. So thank you very much for joining us. This is your first time listening to this podcast. A little bit about it. We love horror, but that doesn't mean that we don't have some problems with it. Uh, This podcast, we like to talk about things that shouldn't work, but somehow do. Or things that should work, and often for many people do work, but just didn't hit the mark for us. And today, we're going to be talking about one of those films that just doesn't hit the mark for us. We're going to be talking a little bit about the... 2014 film It Follows. Now before we get into our discussion and our general thoughts about the film, a little bit of framework to set us up. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, my dissertation was on American horror, and I think that one of the ways to avoid becoming sort of unnecessarily ranty, or to avoid just sort of um, fawning over a particular work, is to frame it in some sort of, of theoretical perspective. And for It Follows, we talked about a couple of different options, but ultimately, I thought the one that might be most interesting, because it speaks to some of our complaints about the film, um, is this concept of the abject. So Julia Kristeva, in a 1982 book, Powers of Horror, plays with some some existing theory, uh, theory by Lacan, you know, so some psychology about how we make meaning, how we create order, and said, well, let's talk about not the things that draw us towards a society or understanding, but things that kind of come in the way. And so she came up with this term abject to discuss the way that we respond to boundaries that we acknowledge that there's sometimes a separation between I and other and where does that line hit and why do we oftentimes find ourselves frightened by that space between I and and other and and so for her this was the concept of the abject um, which is often especially in a book called Powers of Horror going to be really gross right so it's, it's going to be blood and pus and ooze and it's going to also be things like the corpse and even the mother's body in that moment of like oh, remember how I was once like part of your body but now I'm not and I'm my own thing right you were right. Very gross. Yeah, it is. It is. And I, what I love is the word abject sounds gross, too. So I think she found a really good word. But the reason I think it's relevant for our discussion of It Follows is because when you think about some of the discussion of the abject, things come up that are really interesting. So, for example, she talks about the fact that the abject does not prevent us from engaging with death, but in fact, it actually shows us what we permanently thrust aside in order to live. And so we see it and we go, that's not me, um, but I, I see it and I have to recognize this corpse, this, this body. And and that's something that she says often comes up in both religion and art, which she sees as two ways of purifying the abject through this cathartic experience where we're forced to confront this space Um, before binary such as self and other subject and object, which is fitting for a film that has it, right, uh, as as part of its title, this really nebulous pronoun. The other two things that I want to mention real quickly that I think are intriguing in this discussion of the abject, one of them is this idea that she distinguishes it from desire. She says there's, it's something we might engage with and we might sort of almost have an enjoyment of but it's not something that we desire and it's this sort of almost violent passion very animalistic primal yes type of things absolutely which again i think is very fitting for a film that is on the surface about sex but when you watch it it's not really about the desire or enjoyment of sex it doesn't glorify sex or anything like that no absolutely not yeah for all for all it's about it's not 
just a glorified sex film. No, which is which is good. Barbara Creed, who does a lot of work on the concept of the monstrous feminine, incorporates Kristeva's idea of the abject to talk about that disquieting sense within the horror genre that there's something fundamentally wrong or other about particularly the mother's body, but in a larger sense, in a broader sense, the female body. And so in her article, she quotes Kristeva, who talks about how um, abjection is above all ambiguity, because while releasing a hold, it does not radically cut off the subject from what threatens it. On the contrary, abjection acknowledges it to be in perpetual danger. And I think that in a film that is about something that will follow you, no matter what, that you can never escape. Um, but that also, what is it? Well, it's you, it's me, it could be anyone, right? Like, I think that this is a film that, that finds some comfort and some terror in this idea of ambiguity. Yeah. It's not just Anthony and I that are coming up with this idea of ambiguity as being sort of central to this film. Um, you found that that was actually sort of some of the premise from the beginning, right? Yeah, uh, the writer, director, and producer, David Robert Mitchell, actually talked about in an interview with Slant Magazine how he wanted it to be something that could be shared like a game of tag to some degree. I thought if it could be sex, thematically it ties in really well. It's a thing that links people physically as well as emotionally. So it's not, it's really just more of this linking thing, but it didn't have to be sex. It could have been really any shared experience. Uh, and a little bit about the writer, director, and producer, David Robert Mitchell, and he got all three in there. Yeah, that's just, nice. Yeah, that's not his first film, it's his second film first film was The Myth of the American Sleepover, which is not a horror at all, but it's actually a coming-of-age story. Okay. Which I think it follows also is. You could see, you see the influences of that coming-of-age mm -hmm. style in this film. Uh, he began writing the film in 2011, and in an interview with the Dean of Geek, said that the idea came from a reoccurring nightmare he had when he was little, where he was followed by a monster that he instantly knew was bad. It looked like many different people, and he was the only one able to see it or reacting to it. It was always coming towards him, he'd always have to run from it, and it was a constant feeling of dread and anxiety. And can I just say, like, that is a fantastic premise for a horror film. Oh, absolutely it is, because it's one that you can never get away from. No, and and I think it's you know there's a couple of really interesting things, right? First off, it's nothing. That, it's something that you can never get away with from. Second, it doesn't have a consistent form, and so it's not like you can be like, ah, I should avoid that giant clown, yeah, right? Like it's <laughs> oh, I should avoid anybody possibly that is coming towards me, right? At a regular human pace, right? And also, I, I don't know about you, but I used to have reoccurring nightmares actually about trying to tell my parents about something and they wouldn't believe me, right? Like there was a in my dreams there'd be a demon at the bottom of the stairs and they'd be like hey, go downstairs. And I'd be like, no, thank you. And I mean, that was a <laughs> reoccurring nightmare. And there was something fundamentally disturbing because it touches on fears, I think, about um, mental illness and things like that of what if my reality is not the reality that's being shared by everyone else? That is scary. Yeah. Fear of something that only you are able to, something only you are experiencing. Yes. It's no one, there's no one else there who can help you through that experience because you are quite literally the only person going through it. Yes, I mean, to me, that, that might be one of the scariest things possible. So again, concept, super, super fascinating and, and definitely able to, to be the source, and I think a fantastic source of horror. It's very focused. Yeah, and I mean, you can, you can clear see, see clearly that he is a big horror fan, and I mean, he always wanted to do horror because he was a big horror fan and wanted to make it at one point, and Quite honestly, he said uh, when talking about this film, this was an easier sell than another movie he was trying to produce at the time. So he made It Follows, which got released at the 2014 Cannes Film Festival and then received a wider release in 2015. It was a critical success. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes, the critic score is a 96. Metacritic uh, has it at 83. Uh, it got 41 different nominations for awards wow. and won 25 wow. different awards. But uh, the audience score is not quite as high. Yet another one where the critics and the audiences don't agree. Rotten Tomatoes score is 66%. Uh, Metacritic is 7.7 .7, and the IMDb is a 6.9%. Which 
is lower, but it's still really high. It's still pretty high. I mean, those are all, uh, except most of them are passing scores. Yeah. Like, I mean, those, most movies would be pretty lucky if they could get a score that high. And especially horror. Right? Oh, yeah. And I think it's important to, to also say that it's not just, like, the film critics that have been really positive towards it. It's also been film scholars um, and, and horror scholars. This is a film that still has at least one paper presented on it every year at the Popular Culture Association Conference. Because this is a film that, that horror scholars really resonated with positively. Because this one is pretty uh, unanimous. This is when I hear from people that when I tell them I'm doing research about horror, they're like, oh, are you? have you seen It Follows? That's like one of the newer horror films that is in the cultural awareness. That's the one that is broken through to the mainstream and has garnered that mainstream appeal and kind of admiration. There are, admittedly, I think some some areas in which this film does deserve some acknowledgement. And I mean, we've already talked about the incredible premise. Yes. I mean, that concept is never not going to be a good concept. Exactly. Um, and I think, you know, you had mentioned that there were some individual shots that that you liked that, that showed that he, you know, knows what he's doing, that he's aware of the craft. Right. Um, do you have one in particular that kind of struck your fancy that uh, you want to mention at this moment? I really, there was this one shot, this outward shot of the house where everything was perfectly aligned on either side of the window and the color palette was just very striking in that moment and the camera just lingers there and you can see into the house for a second from there and everything is perfectly aligned and you're it's a very Wes Anderson type of shot but it's still very very effective when done right and it is done right in this film and in this context. And I think just his attention to place, mm -hmm. um, you know, he chose wisely. Those houses look like they could be anyone's house. Um, the pool at the end is this beautiful, like, gothic-like building. Oh, yeah. it's The final uh, location is just very distinctly gothic with the lightning. and yes, and the architecture. Very run down. Yes. There are a couple things outside of the film that I liked that I don't know... I don't know if we can attribute them to the film. I think that they're moving sort of almost beyond the film, um, but they are still relevant and worth discussing. So one of them is that I think it's important to acknowledge that this was filmed in Michigan, right? And so regardless of whether or not that was because that was cheaper um, or you know just conveniently located, a consequence of filming there, a consequence of all of them, and there are lots of them, external shots of these boarded up houses, this conversation about how we no longer go past X Street. Yeah. Um, it becomes a film that, that we can see as a commentary on the decaying state of Michigan and also the sort of ways in which the rest of the United States continues to ignore the problems that, the are, problems going that are going on. Because let's face it, if if the children are Michigan, everyone else in the film, especially the adults are the United States, who are like, aw, isn't that sweet that you're having a little powwow? And it's like, well, they are dealing with life and death, but you know, whatever. Whatever. It's. I mean, it's the same reason that we can ignore the Flint crisis. Yes. And just turn our eyes to it, because we can't see it. We're not directly affected by it at the moment. Yes. And so in that way, I think it becomes an excellent metaphor. And I think you also mentioned earlier in our discussion about some commentary on millennials. Yeah. So I know the film tries really hard to, to remove us from time. Yeah. It does that in many ways by not setting a specific time in which the film is taking place. It has technology, the shell phones that are specifically designed to alienate us from a time and not be able to connect to it because we don't have those shell phones right. and no period in time has had those shell phones. Those are unique creation. But at the same time, there are television sets that are of varying ages from various different points in time. The cars are somewhat familiar. There are phones, landline phones that are we can connect to, but we can't place it to any specific point in time. No, and, and I think that that actually is kind of an intriguing aspect of the film, but because it is 2014, right? If we're seeing this film as a commentary on the time in which it's created, one of the things that might be a commentary on her is that generation. So the reason I actually thought about it was the, there's a comic that's called adulthood is a myth and in one of the most recent i have like the day today calendar and one of the recent ones it showed a millennial and a baby boomer and they're racing and the baby boomer like makes it to the end and they're like you're so lazy how come you haven't even made it very far and then you see this like crippling debt 
that has been like locked on to the to the millennial who's like struggling and it kind of reminded me of that idea of you know like there is this attitude towards millennials that they're lazy that they're incompetent that they, if they would just make decisions um but it's always without this acknowledgement of like but what's all the baggage that is going to always follow this group right and whether or not that's student debt or living in a digital age that no one else has ever had to live in um but there's that scene where when they track down the gentleman that had sex with Jay. Right. And they go out to his backyard and like his mom has given them all soda and like snacks and they're all sitting cross-legged like duck, duck, goose style. But Mm -hmm. they're talking about like death and sex and like... Life and death. Real, real big concept thing. Yeah. And you can, and you get the impression that the mom's like, let me know if your friends need anything. Mm -hmm. And that moment made me, there's not enough of it, right? But that moment kind of reminded me that there is a way in which this becomes a commentary on like, but where are the parents? Where are the people that matter? And that is, I think, that is purpose. That is purposeful. We yes. don't see any direct shots of the parents. All of the shots of the parents are askewed. They are either seen from an angle where we can't quite make them out. They're either a little bit blurry in the background or just their faces are removed from the shot. I think that while, like you said, some of that can be seen as being explicitly put into the film, the lack of parents, that particular scene where they're duck, duck, goosing it. Um, <laughs> there's a lot there's not enough of that for that to really be the driving force of this film, mm-hmm. which leads us to, um, so at this point you might be like, well, it sure sounds like you guys liked the film an awful lot. Uh, don't worry. We're getting there. We'll get there. Yeah. In fact, we actually had a conversation prior to, to starting to record that we need to be careful not to be, to sound like we're, we're ranting. We don't want to become internet trolls who just scream about a thing. No, <laughs> that makes me sad. We definitely want to keep it as a critical examination of what our major complaint is. Um, and then we'll talk about how we see that, that issue running out. And then we'll propose a solution that would fix a good chunk of the issues. Yeah. So if we were to sum it up in one sentence, our complaint would be, Anthony? Uh, inconsistency of tone throughout the film. Uh, and this is seen in uh, almost every aspect of it. I mean, f- while I do enjoy some of the shots, some of the shots are so out of place in this film uh, that they are almost comical. In fact, I did laugh several times at some of those. Uh, the script is inconsistent in place. The characters' motivations are inconsistent. Uh, even just that really strong premise uh, is not executed well consistently throughout the entire film. The film starts off actually kind of with a on a strong note, right? Yeah, I think the opening... Sh- scene is quite strong because we see this girl and we don't we don't fully understand what's happening and we don't know her and we don't know her and we don't understand like if she's if she's fleeing from something like why isn't she asking her parents for help like why does she go to the beach like what possibly is bending her at an unnatural angle Mm -hmm. right there's a lot of questions um and that can be a good place to go but i think that the film tries to give us like this really so this is one of the inconsistencies a little bit later we get some very explicit rules about how this world is going to work mm-hmm. but I, I think at that point because the first part has been relying on this fear of like the unknown and the ambiguity exactly that the then to go to the like but here are the rules for survival is one of our first moments of inconsistency because then you have to start questioning things it's okay to be ambiguous i think oh absolutely but once you set up clearly defined rules you have to play by those rules the entire time yeah, so it takes us about 19 minutes into the film to finally figure out what's happening. This is when he was like, you know, hey, by the way, I've given you a sexually transmitted ghost. I just thought you might want to know. But I, and, and this is where we start to run into some of our first issues about, like, this inconsistent, like, what is happening? Yeah, once we get to the STG exposition dump, it starts to force us to ask questions that I don't think the film wants us to. Where I actually have problems, and I didn't realize I had problems with this until the second time watching it, was the whole, like, tying her up. Yep, I I could not, for the life of me, justify that at all. Because I think a simple, hey, sorry, I did give you an STG, um, here's what, here are the rules of it. I don't think we needed to tie anybody up. Yeah, and I want to say that the manifestations of it are so incredibly inconsistent, and mm-hmm. yet, at the same time, they're, they're, dare I say, very problematically consistent. Yes. So they're inconsistent, in there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason to who is doing the following at what time, when they show up. But there is a consistency that 
most of them, most of the it's are women. Yep. And grotesque women, and uh, for um, quite a few of them, naked women. You know, there there are a couple ex- exceptions with men, right? There's yes. the super tall gentleman who has the gouged out eyes. The weird eyes, yes. Yeah, there's the little boy-like thing who's super pale. Mm-hmm. Um, there's her dad. <laughs> there's the naked guy on the roof. We watched this film with someone else who was like, oh, I wonder if this film was made by a man, right? Because it's just like, there's just so many un- unnecessary times that this film says, you know what's scary? The female body. Mm-hmm. But only when the female body isn't attractive. Um, and so we have that, that girl who looks like her face has been punched in or mm-hmm. kicked in, who, um, you know, is partially topless and who's peeing herself. Yeah. Um, we have the mom figure, the, the, the time that it looks like the mom, right, mm-hmm. who is showing her son things that no son wants to see. And then proceeds to have sex with her son right. while killing him. Right. We have the old woman, um, you know, who, when we see every other instance on that campus of, you know, youth and and virility, then we have this. uh, And so, again, it's just very problematic. It's othering women. Yes, absolutely. It's making women abject. Anthony talked about this idea that it's not just inconsistency, right? It's inconsistency of tone. What did you mean by that? Well, so this film, uh, at certain moments, while the opening scene is particularly horrific. I mean, it does mostly a a good job at portraying the horror. There are some scenes that do not read as horror. They actually are so poorly done that they can be read as comedy, almost. This film, and I I don't think it wants to be read as a comedy. It's so, it's doing it so seriously that it almost makes it very funny when they're delivering these lines that are just so poorly written and laughably bad. There are some moments where you're like, this is really kind of on point, or this scene is, is feels very fundamentally real. So I think about some of the some of the scenes with Jay where she's sort of recuperating after having maybe after having had consensual sex but having had a, a rape like experience, yeah. right? Um non consensual passing of this ghost. So some of those scenes are really, I think, very poignant, very beautifully done. And then there's other lines where there's they say things like, oh, is that a human? The person's only 20 feet away. Do you not, can you not tell that that is a person? <laughs> right? Or there's a line where we discover that Hugh's name is not actually Hugh and it's actually Jeff and someone says it's not Hugh and it's like, well, I think we just we, established we that. We just established that. You're were you not listening? What's happening? What? Yeah, and so again, there's just an inconsistency. Bigger fish to fry here. Yeah, like so much bigger fish. Like the whole, there's something supernatural following your beloved, right? Like, um, but again, it's just an inconsistency of of sometimes it seems to perfectly tune into the fears and anxieties and concerns, and then other times it just like steps back and was, and just decides to go the easy route. Mm-hmm. And I think this can be seen in the cinematography. I think so as well because like. This film does have another weirdly consistent thing. It's that it loves panning. Oh, to a degree that I've just never... I mean, I'm sure there have been other films that I've seen that have panned this much. (laughs) I just, for the life of me, can't think what it is. And the reason this is a problem, right, is that the reason it's an inconsistency is because there are other times that you're like, "Mm, he definitely knows what he's doing. And then it's pan, pan, pan. And and we just see the, the camera move horizontally again and again and again showing us things that we don't need right like there are times you need a good horizontal camera movement yep and then there are times where it's just unnecessary like when we're at the school and you're showing us a sequence of going to get the yearbook of this guy and we just get a real big pan over a style it's almost a pan establishing shot while music plays underneath it Oh, thank you for bringing up the music. Yeah, I, I segued into that music because I know you in particular have some strong, big feelings about the music. The very first time I watched this film, I, I barely was able to make it through um, because of the music. So honestly, and I, I know that I'm in massive disagreement, right? Because you've said this is one of the elements in which people really praise this yeah, film. Yeah, it's pretty universally uh, considered one of the best parts about this film is that it's integrated use of uh, the synthesizer throughout almost the entirety of the film. <sighs> and I just like, 
makes me so sad. Okay, so so I joke because it's it's absolutely the only thing I can think of that it reminds me very much of if you're familiar with this in the show Friends when Ross is playing like his music on his keyboard and it's bad right so like the entire time I'm watching this film all I can think about is like Ross in the background composing the music because to me this is another inconsistent moment the music does not match the either the timelessness that is trying to be created because we associate synthesized music with a very specific period in time Mm -hmm. nor does it match the emotional response I think we're supposed to feel 90% of the time that the synthesized music is playing the film forgets that there is really there's power in silence and not being stimulated fully but because there's always that synthesizer doing like a little right (laughs) underneath like the film's most important moments or even in moments where the film could just be allowed to breathe and we could see Jay processing. We can never truly connect with her because anytime she's processing, we hear the little... Yeah, so I would be okay if we heard... Uh, no, I wouldn't. But, <laughs> but if I had to hear that sound every time it was visually present, I think I'd be okay learning to associate that. Because let's face it, most horror music is not exactly filled with tons of different notes, right? Most horror music is limited very effectively to the three or four notes. I mean, think about Jaws, think about Halloween. It's mostly minor keys and it's just, yeah, just like those couple notes right at the bottom. But you're absolutely correct that part of what makes this film scary is this idea that you can be followed by something, but also be never at any other time more alone. I need those moments of, of her being alone to be silent because I need to know what it's like to, to have that, that oppressive silence that she's experiencing because she's not hearing, hopefully, a synthesizer. It really does take you out of the movie oh, because yes, it's one of the added, the added elements over the film that just take you out of it and just rem- further remove you from being able to connect to any of these experiences because they're not hearing this. Hopefully, I hope, maybe that's what's really scary about uh. the experience is that you always, and once you get it, you hear the synthesizer. You know, again, I would be so much more okay if that was the case. <laughs> um, because then I'd be like, okay, well that, that, like you said, that's the real darkness of the film. Not that it will kill you after sexing no, you up. No, it's that you have to listen to yes. the synthesizer constantly. Yes. And but- just when you think it will stop, there's always those three little... Yeah, see, again, that would be scary, right? Like, I could see that as being, like, what was my greatest nightmare? Being followed by a synthesizer, right? Like Being followed by Ross playing yeah. the synthesizer. Yes. see, that is a true legitimate nightmare. The horror genre depends on those non-diegetic sounds, scores, sounds that let us know when to, to jump scene. But the problem is, is that I think you're right, that this music wasn't intended to create a an emotional or visceral response. Right. It's not connected to the creature jumping no. out. No. And so we'll go along with the non-diegetic sound. No, it's just a sound that has been planted over the top yes. of a finished product. If I felt like it had been handled a bit more delicately or, or with more craft, I could see the case that the music is supposed to disenfranchise us from the film because we're supposed to feel disenfranchised just like the millennials right like again i could see a place where this would be a beautiful decision but that's just not how i interpret the music i could probably talk about how much i hate the music in this film for another 20 minutes at least but i think it's worth shifting gears at this point and talking about one of the other really big issues that we had about this film in terms of inconsistencies. And that is in particular, the inconsistencies of the world that it follows has created for us. The film doesn't, it wants us to believe that this is a very isolated experience for whoever has it, Mm -hmm. but other people can touch it Mm -hmm. sometimes. Uh, And sometimes this creature will take its sweet, sweet time killing you, and will do very strange intimidation tactics like climbing on the roof Mm -hmm. or grabbing your hair and just pulling you around rather than, like the other girl from the opening scene on the beach, just snap a leg real quick and just kill you right there. And so it's just inconsistencies like that that then force you to ask questions about the movie while you're watching it when you should be so absorbed in the film. And I think too about the fact that, you know, there's this like there's the scene uh, again when it is the mother and she's knocking and she's waiting until he opens the door. 
but later or earlier in the boathouse, it bursts through it bursts the door. Through the door. And so, it doesn't wait for permission. Right, exactly. And then just to go to the final big climax of the film, the pool plan, mm-hmm. which was an okay plan. The Sure, I'll go with the fact that you want to electrocute it once you can get it in there. But then it decides it can it wants to interact with the external objects, throw it in there, uh, and then it gets in there and it doesn't seem to be able to swim until it can. Yeah. But then it gets shot and sometimes the shots affect it and sometimes it doesn't. And then once you once you start thinking about the internal logic of this creature, you start questioning and by this point I've so tuned out of the film right. and disconnected and thinking about other things. I'm like well, it would seem to be important that this thing could swim because if you go overseas, how does it get there? It can't take a plane, can it? It yeah. would have to be able to swim, wouldn't it? Yeah, there's something about that final <laughs> sequence that feels very Home Alone. It does. Right? It feels absolutely Home alone and And Home Alone works because you're like, okay, well, I don't anticipate these to actually be things that would work. No. Right? But you're absolutely correct. Like, the moment that you open up this, like, can of worms all of these worms start coming out and you do have to ask yourself like what what happens because there's that line about like if you drive you could drive really far and then you know it'll take several days to catch up to you there's that actual line yep so then you're right what would happen if you take a plane yeah um and 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 there's just are you just good then because the creature forgets that sometimes it can swim exactly yeah (laughs) right like or also i think the fact that it's like you said it's throwing the things into the pool like why, Why not just use that more often? Yeah. Why not just pick up, like, a knife or something? Yeah. And then just stab your victims? Yeah, do you need to, like, absorb the essence through sex? Because if you do, it's going to be really hard to have sex with, like, someone who's been electrocuted. Like, there's just so many things that, that don't make sense in this universe, which would be fine, except for the fact that we had this, like, three or four minute scene where it was like, and here are the rules of this of this game. And if we didn't have that scene... These may have still been questions that we had, right. but they wouldn't have been questions that the film has forced us to ask. Exactly. Exactly. Which I think is really important. Everything we've been talking about, though, it's not nitpicky because that, because it is very valid, um, especially like I just keep thinking about like it buying plane tickets. Right. Like, yeah. I mean, there's just like so much about <laughs> this film that that are, is problematic. Well, I mean, it could buy the plane tickets, oh, though, because nice. it can interact with uh it could get a laptop that's and true. it could buy the plane <sighs> tickets itself. Yeah, see, this is going to be our sequel that we're going to make. <laughs> like, European style. Yeah. I like this. See, but, but yeah, it but follows like, this time to Europe. <laughs> yeah. See, I like this. I like this plan. Again, I'd almost have a better time with that. Right. But, like, okay, so so it's an issue. It's a big issue. But, but to me... The number one issue about this film in terms of inconsistency has to do with this transmission style and the and the ways people have consequently read this film. Mm-hmm. This is a film that, that film scholars, that critics read very frequently as a narrative about HIV, AIDS, or some other sexually transmitted disease. Right. As a like commentary on here is the danger, here's what happens. Once you have HIV, you will always have it. Yeah. You will never be able to escape it. It's always there, right? Like The and, ideas about sec- the sexual revolution, uh, primal anxieties about intimacy, uh, and as you mentioned, the HIV AIDS epidemic. And... It's very clear why people feel that way, right? Yeah. Because it's not about anything other than sex. It's about that's how it's transmitted. So so Greg is the neighbor that has sex with her when she's in the hospital, mm-hmm. having just suffered from a broken arm and who knows what other damage, right? And it's never clear, like, why he feels the need to be a hero at this moment. But we also have Paul. Lurky, creepy... Creepy Paul. Paul. Paul who yeah. just can't take no. No. And, like... He, he gets upset that she's not, like, passing on this parasitic no, thing. I want to have... I want to be the yeah. guy who is six with How you. come you didn't come to me first? Maybe because mm. I like you and I wanted you to stay alive. Like, but then we see, you know, that he gets his way and has sex with her. And so it becomes very uncomfortably a film about sex and about the problems. But if we go back to Mitchell... Yeah, so uh, Mitchell himself actually repeatedly says that he's not personally interested in where it comes from. To me, it's dream logic. 
that just is not how the film is being read. No. It's not how the film presents itself for the majority of the time. You can't just dodge on one of the most important elements of the film. Yeah. And you didn't choose just, like, to use dream logic. The film no. did not. They used sex. Yes. Something very human. Yes. Something very real, very concrete, that is not dream logic. No. Again, this is what makes film great, that you can have, you know, interpretations that are not always matched by authorial intent. Because it's not like with the thing about millennials, where I could make an argument, but I'd be making a slanted argument, right? Where you're like, oh, I could see that. I don't think that's what the film was doing. But, like, the film is about sex. Yep. Uh, straight and simple. We have. I mean, it's been simplified. Yes. It's the sex ghost movie. Yes, that's absolutely. Like... And, and this is... I think this is one of the places in which the film kind of just needed to embrace that. So our solution, I think, is is actually, I'm very pleased by it, because I think it mm-hmm. really neatly addresses this issue of inconsistency. Yeah. This film is, I mean, it's it's not very long. It's only 100 minutes. 100 long minutes, but yes. 100 long minutes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I think it's interesting that you use long I when describing a film that is only a hundred minutes, which is actually where our solution comes in. It's almost like you were setting me up to go directly to our solution. We think that this film would work much better as a short film because then it wouldn't be allowed to indulge in all of these different inconsistencies. It would have to take out a lot of these panning shots that are just included for no reasons. It would have to take out sequences that have no repercussions elsewhere. Like when Jay's just laying on the roof of her car, randomly in the woods. Or when she's at the beach, decides to take off some of her clothes, start swimming out to a ship that has three guys on it, and we think, oh, maybe she's passing it on to them, but then we cut back later and she hasn't done any of that. So we're just left wondering... Why has she done that? Right. Or even the scene where they go into the high school to get the the yearbook. I think as much as it is important to show, not tell, this would have been one of those instances where they could have said, well, we went to the high school and we found his yearbook and his real name is Jeff. Right? Like it just, yeah. it wouldn't have taken that much time. Um, and instead we have the scene that really just added seconds and minutes on that were not needed. This feels like one of those cases where the director and writer had a very good idea. Yes. And they were like, I've got this really, really smart idea. And the studio was like, yes, that's a great idea. I'm glad you've pitched it to us. Make me a full movie. Yes. But there wasn't a full movie to be made here. Or he didn't right. make the full movie. It also feels like a movie that those opening, even 19 or 20 minutes were ones that he had been haunted by, right? Mm -hmm. That, like, he kept seeing a girl running out of her home, running back in, grabbing a phone, running out again, and driving off. He saw in his head a girl who just had sex with her boyfriend now tied up um, in an abandoned building. Like, those first 20 minutes really feel as though he had been sitting with them for a very long time. They feel very intentional. Yes, they feel intentional, they feel fleshed out, they feel crafted. Even down to the littlest details, like there's this really interesting game that they play, the trade game, which is very, very specific, and also sounds like a very fun game. It feels real. Yes. And I would honestly keep, to a condensed degree, Jay's depression scenes, because I think that's interesting, this idea that like... Uh, Sans music. Yeah, sans music. And I wouldn't keep as much, I wouldn't keep as many shots of food decaying, right? But but I would keep... <laughs> if, it, if There was a joke throughout while we were watching it. If it doesn't have an establishing shot of the food that the characters eat from overhead, did they really even eat the food? Right, because just the sheer number, like, I, again, if we go back to, like, have I ever seen this before? I don't know if I've ever seen so many establishing shots of food, especially <laughs> with that, like, overhead shot. <laughs> um, it's just there'd be so much that would be that could be cut out. Just so many of the lines, so many of the driving scenes. Yeah. Um, the one friend who seems to serve really no purpose other than to get injured at the end and eat a sandwich, mm-hmm. which is not given to us from an overhead not, shot. There's no establishing shot, so I don't know if she actually ate it or yeah, not. Yeah, right. <laughs> Despite the fact we see her chewing like <laughs> as loudly as yeah, possible. Yeah, but it wasn't established. Yes. So I am a dumb audience <laughs> member, and That's I right. need to have the food established to me. Well then, just you'll <laughs> never be able to eat again, I think. <laughs> but, but I think 30, 45 minutes? Yeah, so a, a longer short film. But just taking out all of the superficial elements that seem to just have been added to boister the runtime. 
Thank you for joining us on this episode of Such a Nightmare. If you enjoyed this, be sure to share it, uh, like it. As we've been saying, memorize it. Memorize it. Uh, send in your own recording of it. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's what we'd love to hear. Love to hear your impressions of us. And join us next time when we will be talking about the 2008 film, The Strangers. Mm-hmm.